Pack them up, boys. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter uh, 8. We're going to look at uh, two places to start this morning, Romans chapter 8 and Proverbs chapter 20. I want to talk this morning about being led by the Spirit. It is important that uh, I've, talked, I've been talking about uh, living, uh, reigning in life as kings. And I don't know that we're really through with that subject. Uh, the Lord has really prompted me that to uh, move into an er another area uh, for the time being. And it's about the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit. It's important for us to understand that even in the reigning in life as kings, we've got to be led by the Spirit if we're going to reign in life as kings. If I'm going to, I, I look in the Old Testament, I realize that, and, and so let's lay a little foundation. When we get into the Old Testament, we find that it was only the kings and the priests and the prophets that were filled with the Holy Spirit. When we move into the New Testament, we find out that every believer has the uh, uh, available to them to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to tell you that not all believers are led by the Holy Spirit because not all believers choose to uh, cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Not all believers choose to uh, experience uh, the second experience of, of uh being filled with the Holy Spirit, or what Jesus said, the promise of the Father. Um, we hear it called all kinds of different things, whether it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus simply called it, uh, go to Jerusalem and wait until you're endowed with power from on high when the promise of the Father comes upon you. But sometimes we only relate being led by the, or being filled with the Spirit, with the power. And I'm not taking anything away from the power. Uh, the power of the move of the Holy Spirit, uh, it's the thing that brings miracles. It's the thing that, that operates in the gift of healing, uh, the word of knowledge, word of prophecy, all of the gifts. Uh, those are the things that we see. But being led by the Spirit is the thing that is available to each one of us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That 16th verse says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So the first thing that the, that the Spirit does is, is bears witness that we are the children of God inside of us. I know that I know that I know. Somebody could tell me, well, you know, that thing's not really true. And, and if you uh, accept Jesus, it's, it's not really true that you'll uh, have eternal life with him because, but, I bear, but my spirit bears witness. You can't talk me out of my salvation. And that's what Paul was talking about there. But in the 14th verse, he's talking about being led. And, and we're going to get into that this morning. We're going to look at seeing what being led really consists of and being led, how it really does uh, bring us to a new level. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 27. Proverbs 20, 27. If you haven't been here very long, you know that I... Wait till I quit here and pages turn for a reason. Because if you don't read it in your own Bible and you're reading it off of that screen and you're only listening to me, then when you get home, I'm not going to be there and that screen's not going to be there. You've got to have this in your own Bible. And, and if you've been here very long, you find out that uh, I'll tell you from time to time to underline some things. And, and uh, if you don't own a Bible that you can underline or that you write in, uh, go down and get you a Bible that you can write in so that you uh, don't uh, uh, have an, uh, when you have an opportunity to look back, you've got it there. I picked up, uh, actually picked up my wife's Bible the other day. I think it was Wednesday night when I was preaching. And uh, 
No, it wasn't. We were trying out the microphone. We were getting everything set on the, the new microphone the other day, and I picked up Kathleen's Bible, and there was something underlined, and wow, it was just like, man, that was good. And uh, I, uh, I appreciate uh, being able to pick up somebody else's Bible and seeing what, uh, what they've underlined, because her and I don't underline the same things. And uh, what she did, it was a good word, and it was something that just jumped out at me right at that place. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 27 says, The spirit of a man is the lamp unto the Lord, searching all the inner deep depths of his heart. Your spirit is a lamp unto the Lord. So when we're, we go over and realizing that we're in the Old Testament, and this was something that was written by David actually in, in this particular proverb, we look and we realize that there's a greater... David was a king, so he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with uh, God's Spirit. He heard from the Spirit. Um, we only have one account that he made a wrong choice. I want you to listen to me. Just because you're filled with the Holy Spirit doesn't mean that you won't make a wrong choice. But if you're led by the Spirit in all things you do, you won't make a wrong choice. You'll make a God-given choice. You'll make a choice that, that brings you to the place where you'll see what, uh, what Stephanie even, the, the Jeremiah 29, 11. I love that verse, and I love the version that she quoted this morning. Um, that, for not, uh, that his idea isn't calamity in our life. But sometimes we bring calamity on our life because we don't cooperate with what the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us to do, bringing us into that place. And God really spoke that word into me. He says, you know, you've got to cooperate with me for me to be able to, uh, to do what I want to do in you. And we make a choice whether we cooperate with the leading of the Holy Spirit where we actually do what the Holy Spirit has told us to do or we don't. And when we don't, then it's that place that, see, just because God, God says, I know that my thoughts towards you and they're not for calamity, but they're for a future, doesn't mean that I'm going to have an expected end that God has if I don't cooperate with what he wants to do. And so it's important for me to know what direction he wants to go. And, and that's what we're going to look at today. When the Holy Ghost says something, it is more authoritative than the inward witness. Now, the inward witness, and, and we're going to look at the difference this morning between the inward witness and when the Lord gives us a word... The inward witness is the most important thing that we understand that being led by the Spirit is. When I do something, I have a witness inside that I'm doing the right thing. I begin to go a direction because I've, I've felt on the inside that it was... See, some people always wait to hear a word from the Lord, whether it's a word of prophecy or or a word of knowledge, or they just, they begin to pray, God, I have to have a word. I got to know how you want to do this. I want to, you know, sometimes we need to just understand that that inward witness on the inside of us is something that if I'm going, I go as much on what God doesn't say as what he does say. Because when I'm going a direction that I felt prompted to go, if he doesn't say, whoa, wait, if he, if I don't have a, I, in, 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 you'll hear me say a check in my spirit, just that kind of wadded up feeling, a check in my spirit just means like, boy, this might not be the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Our kids are learning on, on uh, uh, family night that uh, you, we, uh, our children's minister has had a, a green, yellow, and red light, you know, like a traffic light up here. And she says, what does the green light mean? Well, the green light means go. That's what that inward witness does. Sometimes if I get going a direction and off and doing something that I felt like I was supposed to do and I have that green light that just feel good inside, I don't have a stop. That yellow light, what does that mean? Caution. Watch out. Sometimes just the leading of the Holy Spirit is just a caution inside. And that doesn't mean stop, but it means proceed with caution. Watch closely what you do. So that was a, a good, a good uh, example. 
in that place. But then sometimes it's that, that wadded up that I call it or a check in my spirit just means all of a sudden I feel clammy inside and it's like, don't do this. And, and we've been uh, teaching the kids that's like a red light, red traffic light. You know, what are we going to do at a red traffic light? We're going to stop. If we don't stop, then we suffer the consequences of the policeman that's on the other side or a car or the camera. And the biggest thing can be the wreck. And that's exactly what happens in life when we don't listen to the stop from the Holy Spirit. So when I say I go as much on what he doesn't say as what he does say is if I'm going a direction and I know that, that I'm being led by the Spirit in everything I do. See, the Bible tells us that Jesus said this. He said that uh, my Father and I will come and make our home inside of you. And then he said, I will send the Comforter He'll lead you, he'll guide you into all truth and tell you of things to come. So I realize that when I get going a direction and, and I'm doing something, it may just be something I want to do, not something I've particularly felt led to do or that I should do right now or the Lord said, I want you to do this. It may be something I want to do. And as I begin to go that direction, if I don't all of a sudden hear, oh, see, I might be headed for a wreck. It's just exactly like running a red light. If I'm headed for a wreck, I, don't, I want to stop right now. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. He wants us to not have calamity in our life. So it may not really be an audible voice. And sometimes people just wait for an audible voice. I will tell you, I want you to listen to me. This is really important. Don't seek somebody to give you a word of prophecy, and I don't care if it's me. You should not be waiting to hear a word from somebody else. A word of prophecy or a word of knowledge is almost always a confirmation to something God's already dealing with you about. And if you're moving by a word of prophecy that comes on the outside, I'm going to give you an example. I have, I had a, a, a actually, it's, I just haven't seen him in a lot, lot of years. I still a pastor friend of mine. At that time, he was my pastor. And uh, there was a prophet that came through and preached. Man, I mean, this guy was good. Uh, gave a, but he gave a prophecy to the pastor in the back room. I happened to be uh, uh, on a, uh, on a uh, committee, a pastoral committee in that church. And, and uh, uh, because I was ordained minister, I could, there were certain places I couldn't serve. You know, they don't want you to take the pastor's job away from him, and I didn't want it, believe me. Uh, but uh, this particular committee I served on, the pastor came to us, and he says, look, this prophet that came through, he says, he gave me a word, and I'm resigning. The word he gave him was that if you continue to stay here, it's going to destroy your ministry. Man, I mean, this church was growing. We were about to buy 55 acres out on the highway because we'd grown so big. And just, and I mean, this pastor had gone into even, he, he got the guy that owned the liquor store downtown, accepted Jesus, and he sold the liquor store and bought him a, a, a gym because he said, I want to build lives. I don't want to tear lives down. And so, you know, we see how, what a great work was going on through God. Well, God had never dealt with this pastor about that. But because he moved on this prophet, all of a sudden he resigned. I'm going to tell you, he has never pastored a church for, to this day. I know where he's at, even though I haven't talked to him. He has not pastored a church that has grown or been what that church was because he moved on what a prophet said instead of what the inner witness said to him. And it's, so it's important for us to realize, and this isn't about him, but it's understanding that you may be headed for a wreck because you listen to somebody from the outside instead of the inward witness, instead of the voice that God, if God lives inside of you and God leads you and guides you by his spirit, then what will happen is you will know the voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. 
So the, she the, the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. So we always move by what the voice to the shepherd is. I don't move by what somebody else is. I've had people give me a, a word, and, and I've always... Uh, I've, if, if it's a word that God hasn't dealt with me about, then I tuck it back on a shelf someplace. And, and if it comes to pass sometime or God begins to deal with me about that from that direction, I happen to never, I had a guy one time, uh, I walked into a, actually I walked into a hotel room in, Red, in uh, Redwood City, California. And this guy looks at me and I knew he was a prophet. I'd, I'd, I'd heard him uh, give words that were confirmation to other things. He looked at me and he says, you're about to birth something that's really ugly. Man, I'm going to tell you what, that was a word I didn't want to hear. But it wasn't something God had dealt with me about. And, and it happened to be that not too long after that, uh, we birthed a new work. And, and uh, you know, in, the back of my, in that back shelf, I, ha I remembered what he said. You know what? Two years later when it got really ugly, I just kept staying the course because the word was you're going to burst something that's really ugly, but it's going to finish great. And, be, and I didn't move on what the word he said because I tell you, I don't care anything about ugly. I don't want to be around ugly. I want to be around something that's going to finish great and not something that's going to get ugly in the, in the, in the middle of it. But God wants us to always know. You know, that's tell you of things to come. He'll give you that inner w inward witness in that place and then he may confirm it from the outside but don't ever move just because somebody's talked to somebody else. Some people a, a, a side note or, or just to, to expound a little bit more is that God doesn't talk as much by an audible voice as he does by that inward witness or that inward prompting or knowing. He does talk by an audible voice sometimes. Some people never hear the audible voice and some people hear it a lot. And it's not, it, it doesn't mean that one's more spiritual than the other. It just means that it's a different way that God talks to, to people. Some people even, for example, have someone on their heart that they want saved and so they, uh, they want to pray that they'll get saved. I want to talk to you about that this morning. Cooperate with the Word. The Word will always be uh, confirmed by what the Holy Spirit leads. The Holy Spirit will never lead you to do something outside of what the Word says. I want everything the Word says. I want to operate every way the Word says. And I know that the Holy Spirit will never tell me to pray a way that doesn't line up with the Word. I want you to turn to Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. If you've been here and I've prayed for people that you may have family members or, or friends uh, that you want, want to know Jesus, or you'll find out, I don't pray that they'll get saved. That's not scriptural. What is scriptural is exactly what the Word says. Luke chapter 10 and verse 2 says, Then he said to them, I'll wait just a second. Okay, I'm here. That's good. And then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the labors are few. See, the harvest is great. This isn't the only place he said that. He said it over in John also. What did he say? He said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he send labors. And so what is scriptural is God sends somebody by that they have a high regard for to share with them the place that they need to be. And, and the truth is, is most family members aren't going to listen to you anyway. If they were going to listen to you, they'd already listen to you. That doesn't mean that you won't ever get to harvest family members, but it means most family members aren't going to listen to you, but they will listen to somebody that's anointed by the Holy Spirit. And this is what I pray. I pray, Father, because the Bible says in another place that no one comes to the Father lest the Spirit draw them. So I pray, Father, send somebody by that they have a high regard for that will speak Spirit-anointed words 
that'll fall on spirit-anointed ears, and they'll harvest in that place. That's what the Bible says. And so we want to know that always that when we're led by the Spirit, we cooperate with what the Word says. That also means that if I want to prosper, then I've got to cooperate with the Word in every place that it talks about prosperity because we already know that it's God's plan that we prosper, but if it's God's plan for me to prosper, what do I need to do to cooperate with that? It says, given will be given unto you. So I know that that's one place that I've got to do. Another place it says, give to the poor. So if, if I'm supposed to uh, prosper, actually, what, and here's what it says. If you give to God, he gives pressed down, shaken together, and, and running over. Gives, to make room for more. We are uh, Luke 6.38. In Proverbs, it tells us that if we give to the poor or give to someone that's in need, that God will pay us back. So I know that my multiplication comes from giving to God, but I'll be restored because I give to the poor. So, you know, there's always promises in the Word, and i got to cooperate with what the promise is if I want to have what it says. That's, so the Holy Spirit doesn't have to lead me into that place. That's one of those places that I'm going to just proceed because that's what the Word says to do. I'm going to do it that way. And then if the Holy Spirit all of a sudden, I, this is one thing that I do. I've had several people, um, and I, if you've ever worked in the office of a church or been a, uh, in, a, in a position to do this, I have people that call me sometimes uh, or call the church uh, on a daily basis and sometimes two or three times a day that are looking for a handout. You know, want us to pay a hotel bill or need an electrical bill or something paid. And, and that's the place that I always want to be led because I don't always want to say no and I don't always want to say yes because I maybe I'm supposed to and maybe I'm not. And that's that place whenever they'll, they'll start talking. I've done that. I've gone down and paid the hotel bill for somebody because I felt uh, inside that I, I felt that green light. I felt like it was supposed to, what we were supposed to do. One guy calls one day and he says, uh, the Lord told me to call you. <laughs> and uh, I laugh because all of a sudden when the Lord tells me to do something, then I always want to hear what Lord they're listening to. Don't look for voices. I'm going to go back to that place where I said, uh, look, when you're looking for a word, don't just listen to voices. you got to know that the voice is the voice of the Father. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't talk about his own stuff. He talks about what he's been told to talk about. That's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit won't speak of Himself, but he'll speak of things that he's heard and things that he's been told. And so we know that he'll confirm what God's already said. So this guy calls and he says, uh, turn to Acts chapter 10 while, we're, while I'm sharing this. This guy calls and he says, the Lord told me to call you. And he started to tell me this whole story about how he was a minister and that he had uh, uh, been separated from his wife and the Lord had told him to go home to, to his wife and he needed money to get there. And uh, he actually was in a restaurant right downtown here and, and uh, when he called me and, and as he went on and, and I listened. The Lord told me, he says, just be quiet and listen. I still didn't know if I was supposed to buy a bus ticket or what I was supposed to do, so I was just listening. And all of a sudden then he was going to, uh, his wife was in, in a town way out in West Texas, and he was going to Oklahoma. So he needed to get to Oklahoma. And I said, well, but I thought you said you were going to go get back with your wife because the Lord told you to get back with your wife. And uh, he went on with more story, and I'm still listening to, to I'm just doing what, and all of a sudden, the Lord says, okay, now tell him. No. Whoa, okay. I mean, I've listened to this guy for 20 minutes. And all of a sudden, I, I told him, I said, you know, I, 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 I feel like the Lord's telling me to, to tell you no. You need to go home to your wife now. I said, if you want a bus ticket to go home to your wife, that's fine. No, 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 I'm going to Oklahoma first. I said, well, then we're not going to, then I'm not going to do anything. And he says, well, you're not listening to the same Jesus I'm listening to. 
Don't let somebody's condemnation change what the Holy Spirit has shown you inside. Be led by the Spirit in all things. And then what will happen is you'll succeed. I believe that this guy really wasn't ever going back to uh, get with his wife. He was just looking for a handout and he figured the best way that he could do it was to play on uh, a pastor's heartstrings about because my heart is that marriages succeed. My heart is that pastors get back in the place that they're supposed to be so that they can be used of God the, the way that they were. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. <clears throat> you know, I'm going to stop just before we read that. I want to talk about fasting for a minute. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more as we get in. Fasting does not move God. Fasting gets you in a position that you sacrifice something that's important to you and it gives you more time to read and pray. Because when, you're, when you would be eating, most of the time, you're going to be reading and praying because you're hungry and you want to spend time doing something that will fulfill you in that place. So it actually is for you to get in a position to hear God. It doesn't move God because you're fasting. It just gets you in a position to be able to hear Him. So uh, having said that, we'll get on to another scripture a little later on where it'll talk about that more. Acts chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near to the city, Peter went up to the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Uh, skip down to verse 19. While Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, now listen, this is what happened. He was praying. As he was praying, he began to, it says, fell into a trance. We know that if you read in the in-between where we're not looking, that God gave him a vision that where he unfolded a, a, a big uh, sheet and all these animals. In other words, he was showing him that it was okay to go talk to the Gentiles. <clears throat> While Peter thought about the vision... The Spirit said to him, see, he got in a position that the Holy Spirit talked to him about it because he was spending time with the Lord. And then he began to reflect on what, because it said he thought about the vision. Verse 20, or it says, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now, when he did that, and he went into Cornelius' house and, and uh, he uh, was able to minister uh, Jesus and, and they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, baptized him in water. Uh, and then we're going to go down to the 11th chapter of the 12th verse. Realizing that the church called him on a carpet for preaching to somebody that wasn't their own. And to tell you, Kathleen and I, one time we were in Grenada, California at a rodeo and we'd been invited to, to speak in this church that morning. We'd done a church at a rodeo real early in the morning and, and they'd invite us to preach in this church. Well, the Lord had told me to preach a word, the, what, what the word to preach, and it was uh, about uh, the disciples going and, and sharing. And, and uh, I walked into the church and I found out they didn't believe that you were supposed to go to anybody. They actually believed that if you were going to be saved, you'd be in their church. And uh, let me tell you something. It doesn't change the word. Don't ever, because you're in a position that don't compromise the word or what the Lord has led you to do just because somebody doesn't believe it. If you'll operate by what the word says and you'll do what actually what wound up happening was before church was over, they invited me to go do a funeral that afternoon for somebody out, that, out of the church because the pastor was gone. And, uh, you know, we had a, another opportunity to share the gospel in that place. But I found out that we were in a position. We, and, and that's what when, when uh, 
I thought about uh, them being called on the carpet for not preaching to their own. That's exactly the position that we were in that time. Acts chapter 11 verse 12 says, Then the Spirit told me, Peter is right now given account because he's been called on the carpet. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me into the man's house. The Amplified says it this way, And the Holy Spirit instructed me to accompany them without the least hesitation or misgivings or discrimination. So these six brethren accompanied me also, and we went in to the man's house. I thought about that. You know, how many times or how many churches would have accosted him for, you know, you didn't have to take those other six guys with you too. Realize you need to be moved by God's Spirit. Do what God's Spirit leads you to do because that was the uh, first place that the gospel was preached to the Gentiles. And, and that's the reason that you and I are sitting here today is because Peter went in and he obeyed what the leading of the Holy Spirit was and it started the first move into the Gentiles in that place. So we realize that God has a plan when he's leading us to do something, leading us in that place. We're moving by that inward witness that causes us to fulfill what God wants to do. Okay, we've seen so far uh, the ways that we're led. Number one, if you're taking notes, number one is the voice of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes there's an audible voice. Sometimes God will speak into you uh, with a with I can tell you that I there's only been a couple of times but I've literally heard an audible voice where I wanted to turn around and see who was there but most of the time uh, it's that small voice or that inward witness in that place number two is visions but I want to tell you don't just look and wait for visions God will give you a vision sometimes I'll tell you one that he gave me. We were, we were actually on the way to, pre to preach the first service of Silver Auto Cowboy Church when we started out at Silver Auto Cutting Horse Barn. I was going, I can, I can tell you where I was. I could tell you what the, I'd stopped and fueled the motor home up. We were at, uh, just outside of Seymour on the way in here. And uh, when we... Uh, when, when, when I got back in a motor home, it's one o'clock in the morning because I looked at my watch whenever the Lord showed me this vision. And, and, I was, uh, and, and I wasn't tired. I wasn't seeing visions because I was tired because Kathleen and I had just changed places and, and I just took over driving. I've been sleeping for a long time. So when he showed me this vision, he showed me a building. Now remember, we're going for the first service at the Cutting Horse Barn. Kathleen and I had never started a church that had over five people there the first night. And, and, and that was the 10th church that we had started. And uh, so when he showed me this, I knew it was a significant thing that he was speaking to us. And what he showed me was this building plus the, the second building that we've already had drawn for with an 1800 seat sanctuary and you can look around and go man I don't even know why you drew that I drew it because the Lord showed me that vision and I know where we're going and I know what it's going to look like it gave it was so explicit when he showed me that vision that when the uh, architect drew the second building and the connection here it wasn't what the Lord had showed me and so I told him no it's got to be this way uh, and him being a, a spirit-filled Christian, he, uh, he looked at me and he says, we're going to do it the way the Lord said to do it. And the second one he sent me was exactly what the Lord had shown me. By the way, I'm going to uh, meet with him on Thursday to uh, get him to go ahead with the drawing that we're going to hang on the wall here. But it was a vision that God gave, with, gave me of exactly how this was supposed to look and, and how the arena was supposed to look and came to a place that even uh, the guys that were here helping build the arena uh, when we built it know that w one of the men that was there doing it, he says, I really don't care because God gave the pastor a vision at how this is. If God gave him a vision that we were going to build this arena on the sky 
we'd find a way to do it because that's what the Lord said to do. And that's the way that we have to get when God gives us a vision. Once more, I can't tell you that he's given me a lot of other visions, but he gave me a vision of that. He gave me a vision of, of what we were supposed to do and exactly how we were supposed to do it in uh, Nigeria. And that's the way we're proceeding in Nigeria is we're doing it exactly the way that the Lord said to do it. Um, know this, when God gives you a vision and leads you into a place, there's not, it's not without obstacles sometimes. Sometimes there's obstacles that come up and, and you have to stay the course. Don't ever compromise just because an obstacle come, come up. I believe that when God gives you a vision that the devil gets mad when you begin to fulfill that vision and he'll try to bring obstacles that will slow you down. And all you've got to do is you've got to stop those obstacles, bind, that, bind the enemy in that place and stay the course. Don't change your vision or the way that you're doing it because you're having an obstacle. It continue that way and don't give up and don't quit and God will bring it to pass. God will watch over a vision that he gives you to bring it to pass if you'll stay the course and stay with him. Number three, this, we're looking at uh, what we've looked at so far about uh, here and being led by the Spirit. Number three is the still small voice or the inward witness. So we've got the voice of the Holy Spirit, visions, and the still small voice or the inward witness. Turn to, uh, we're going to look at the inward witness. Turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27, verse 9 and 10. If you notice, we've looked at, uh, I think this is either the second or the third place we've looked at verse 9, or ten, nine and 10. I think it's uh, significant that the Lord spoke several things in verse 9 and 10. Uh, even how to get saved, if you look at Romans uh, 10, 9 and 10. So... Uh, that was just a side note because I don't think there's anything to it actually because the Bible wasn't written in uh, chapters and verses, but that gave you time to get there. <laughs> now when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, uh, the fast that it's talking about was the Day of Atonement, uh, the, the fast in Israel, Paul advised them saying, Men... I perceive, you notice he didn't say, the Lord told me, and Paul never, was never afraid to say the Lord told me. But instead he says, I perceive. In other words, he had an inward witness or an inward leading, a uh, small voice inside that this voyage will end in disaster and much loss, not only cargo and ship, but also our lives. Protection comes from an inward witness. We were uh, going uh, to uh, uh, over to Heritage of Faith for a Chariots of Light meeting several years ago. And as we went along, I can't tell you that I had a, a, a anything but just a still small voice or I perceived that we needed to slow down at an intersection. Light was green. There was no reason. I mean, you couldn't see any traffic anywhere. And, and, but yet, we, th there was three of us going along there, and I was leading, and I, I just slowed down. Everybody slowed down. And just as we got to the intersection, a van pulling uh, 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 lawnmowers and stuff blew the stoplight going the other way. And because of the I perceived that we needed to slow down or that inward uh, leading. What happened was we would have been right in the middle of the intersection and it might have been that all three motorcycles got wiped out and we got killed. But that leading of the Holy Spirit or that inward witness or I, as Paul called it, I perceive uh, that we should do this. Make sure that you listen to that inward leading or that inward perception that we should do that doesn't, doesn't mean that uh, we get intuition. We realize that, you know, and the world calls a lot of things different things. Intuition should never be something just because I think it in my head, but I feel it in, inside. God talks to you inside. He talks to you in, in, in down in 
in your spirit, man, we, we say is down in here in your heart. An interchange in the, in the Bible for uh, uh, spirit is heart. So we realize that it's down inside, not in your head. Skip down to uh, verse 21 through 24. But after a long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and, do not, and have not sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. What you find out is they've been throwing cargo over all the time to try to get out of the storm that they've been in. Verse 22 says, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of, the, of God, of the God whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. Indeed, God has granted you all of those who sail with you. So we see what happened. Paul was fasting. Did that move God? No, that didn't move God. But it got Paul in a position that he was able to hear the voice of God because he was spending time with God instead of on the deck going, man, this storm sure is bad. Amen. Instead, he was spending time getting in a position to hear from the Lord, and the Lord sent an angel to speak to him. Turn to chapter 13. I want to look at another place of being... Uh, uh, hearing the audible voice of God. Chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. Still in the book of Acts. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simon, who was called Niger, Lu Lucas of Cyrene, Manaeah, who had been brought up with Herod the Teric, Tatriarch, and Saul. Now I want you to listen to this. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. Guidance from the Holy Spirit is to do something at a certain time and to proceed with it. That's exactly what happened here. But look at where it came. It came at a time. What did they, it say they were doing? Verse 2. They, as they ministered to the Lord. I want to talk to you this morning about prayer time. I want to talk to you about how important prayer time is. The prayer time that we have here before church is not uh, just something that we have because it feels good or because there's certain spiritual people that go into the kitchen and, and, and spend time with the Lord. Actually, what we're doing is we're ministering to the Lord. I want to read to you what the meaning of, of ministering to the Lord is. Minister from the strong said, to be a public servant, to perform religious or charitable charitable functions, worship only and relieve minister. We realize that, what are we doing? We're worshiping the Lord when we get into that place that we start praying in the Spirit. When we start praying together corporately. I'm not just talking about on Sunday mornings, but I'm talking about corporate prayer on Wednesday night when we have corporate prayer. By the way, uh, this particular month, uh, our uh, prayer pastor will be gone uh, on vacation. So prayer, uh, corporate prayer is the second Wednesday in June, uh, which is uh, somewhere around the 10th, I think, or something like that, whatever the second Wednesday is. From the vines, the word minister, we're talking about ministering to the Lord, demoted among the Greeks, firstly, one who discharges a public office at his own expense. And I thought that was really significant when I looked at it because when we're ministering to the Lord, it may mean you need to sacrifice some other time or some, something else you might, be, might have been doing to get away and to spend time with the Lord and to, maybe you want to do something else, but it's time you want to hear from the Lord. 
Spend time with Him. Get alone. Minister to the Lord. Worship Him. Listen to Him. Read. Pray. Spend that time where you begin to hear His voice. And, and it may cost you something. Because what that word meant from the Greek was that it was a, somebody that did a public office at his own expense. In other words, he didn't get paid for it. Reminded me of back when uh, Harry Truman was president. Did you know that when he left office, he uh, got in his, him and his wife got in their own car and drove home without the Secret Service watching over them, and he didn't get a retirement plan after it was over. When his job was over, he went back to doing the job that he had done before. And, and uh, that's something that we have to realize is just because I'm going to spend time with the Lord doesn't mean I'm going to get anything out of it other than the mind of God and the leading of the Lord. And I get myself in that position that I may have given up something that I'd really like to do so that I can hear what the Lord has to say. What I've learned over the years is I'd rather hear what the Lord has to say than anything else because what it does is it brings everything else into a position that it just flows along the way that it should because I've spent that time with the Lord. It went on in the vines and it said, then in general, public servant, minister, a servant, attendant, a deacon. I like the... the uh, word pictures in the New Testament. It says this, as they minister to the Lord is an old verb used of attic orators who served in the state at their own cost, work, or service. Common of priests who served in the tabernacle in Exodus, where here it's of worship, prayer, exhortation, and fasting. So we realize that what they did was that they would hear from God. And going back to Acts chapter 13, they heard from God because they were spending time with Him. They had set their self apart to do everything. Now, here's what I want you to know. Nobody was paying the disciples to do this. In fact, it says that they sold, if you go back into the the fourth chapter, you find out that they sold everything that they had and put it in one pot so everybody could eat if they needed to eat or whatever needed to be done. So they weren't being promoted because they were being paid to do this. They were doing it because they were called to do it. And they were doing it at their own expense. So they, when they set their self away to hear from the Lord, because the Lord had told them, I'll provide for you and everything. Do you know what He's told you and I? I'll provide for you in all things. He says it'll be by... Me that you, when we look at Philippians 4.19, what's it say? He'll supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Gets me in a position that I realize that the best thing I can do is set myself to hear the Lord and to minister to him and do nothing but minister to him in that place so that I can have his leading and I can have all the things that I, that I want to receive from him. So when I talk about corporate prayer here on Wednesday nights, it's not to make us feel good for you to come, but it's a time that we set aside. And you realize that it's exactly what the disciples did. They could all went to their prayer closet. We could all think, well, you know, I could go to my prayer closet and I can just hear from the Lord myself. But we can't hear from the Lord the same way as we do in a corporate prayer Place. And that's the reason that it's important for Sunday morning. What you find out in those that go to prayer time on Sunday morning, what they find out is almost every time what they've prayed out in prayer time is what the pastor preaches in the service and, and whoever's preaching, whether it's I'm preaching or Kathleen's preaching or, or John or it, God, they just move in that place that we literally have done. That's exactly what we want. We want to have a word from the Lord. We don't want to have a word that the pastor's cooked up or studied or this or that. You don't know how many times that I've walked in here and basically thrown my notes away because the Holy Spirit moved on me about something else and come to find out that it was something they'd prayed out in prayer time 
just before, and the Lord had spoke to him in prayer time about that. And I don't find out until church is over because somebody comes and says, that's exactly what we prayed about in prayer time this morning. We'll go figure how the Lord would do something because we minister to the Lord and we begin, he, what he does is he changes the atmosphere of everything around us, not just talking about church, but changes the atmosphere of everything around us so that it fulfills the need and the desire that we want in that place. God knows what... what uh, he wants to do and how he wants to do it. And all we have to do is cooperate with that place so that we can have it. I've laid hands on people that in the Lord will speak these kind of things to you. I've had laid hands on people that have had terminal diseases and, and I looked at them and, and, and I've done this every time. Because like I told you, sometimes you don't know what somebody's going to do or what they're going to say. But sometimes the Lord has spoke to me, said, tell them they'll live and not die. And, and I've given that word. I remember the first time that uh, a lot of you know Rick Holiday, And if you don't, you can, if you go to prayer time, Rick and Patty Holiday's pictures on the wall in there. And Rick had just got into the ministry and, and really hadn't uh, preached very much. But he was at a roping and, and preached that, that morning. And uh, a horse reared over backwards in the chute and, and hit a guy on the head and he was in a hospital. But a doctor told him, told his wife, says, get ready because he won't live till morning. And Rick got there at midnight to pray, pray with him. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, Rick called me and he says, man, I got to tell you what the Lord told me. The Lord told me to walk in there. Now, listen to me. This guy didn't know Jesus. He had never accepted Jesus as his Savior. His wife didn't know Jesus. She had never accepted Jesus as her Savior. And he says, the Lord told me to walk in there and look at his wife and says, he'll live and not die. And the doctors already told him they're not going to live till morning. The only reason they called Rick was they wanted him to kind of give the last rites like a, like a priest would. Excuse me. And uh, I said, well, Rick, if the Holy Spirit, and I thought, whoa, well, well, that's going to be a bold step, Rick. But I told him, I said, you know what? If the Holy Spirit spoke that to you, go in there and give that word with a boldness. Amen. And he said, okay, I will. And he walked in there and he told that wife. Now, I mean, that wife's getting all ready. She's, not, she's called the kids. She's got everything in position. She knows he ain't going to live till morning. <clears throat> you know, the doctor doesn't know everything. They only operate by, the, by what they know in the natural to do. And he looked at him and he said, uh, he'll live and not die. You know what? She took heart. All of a sudden, she just, it, remember, she didn't know Jesus yet. He got up at 10 o'clock the next morning and walked out of the hospital. Accepted Jesus. His wife accepted Jesus. The kids accepted Jesus. See, God is glorified when we listen to what the Lord says. So you listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit in places like that and know that God's going to do something great because you'd listen to. And like I told you, I don't just say that because I laid hands and prayed for somebody. The Lord better tell me <coughs> that He wants me to do that before I do it. Thank you, sir. Many Christians only want to be led by the Spirit in financial matters. God bless me. God prosper me. God, how do I do this in my job? How do I do this in my business? Let me tell you this. If you don't spend time with God, and you don't listen to God about other things, you won't be able to hear when it comes to financial decisions. But if you get in the habit of listening to God and listening to that inward spirit, then what will happen when you come to a financial decision or a fin financial place where you want God to bless you, He'll just lead you into that place because you're used to hearing His voice. You can't choose to be led by the Spirit in some things and not other things. To be led by the Spirit, we've got to be led in all things so that we're ready every time He speaks to go ahead and move in that place. Learn to walk. 
I've, I've written down some things that the, that the Holy Spirit spoke to me, and so I keep coming back to make sure that uh, I'm taking care of it. Learn to walk in the light of what he says, and then you can do... Learn to walk in the light of what he says. I talked about that earlier. I, I, I actually already covered that. Talking about learning to walk in what the Word says. And knowing that what it says in, in uh, Proverbs 20, 27, that that spirit of a man is a light... So when I walk in the light of what his word says, then what will happen is I'll walk in the light that his spirit can lead me and guide me in those places. And then I'll know, you've got to read the word in order to be led by the spirit. Because God will never lead you a direction that the word won't confirm. And so I've got to know the word if I know that the spirit's going to lead me in that place. Otherwise, I might be listening to a different voice instead of what his word says. And as his word says it, and then he leads me to do that and to move that direction, then I'm walking in the light of what he says so that I can begin to do that. Be ready to make an adjustment. Sometimes the Lord will begin to, to you'll be going and there's nothing to matter with the direction that you're going, but he'll tell you to adjust just a little bit so that we can have a, a quicker finish or a better finish or get to the place that he wants to get uh, by making that adjustment. Last thing I want to tell you this morning regarding being led by the Spirit is if you're seeking a word from God and you haven't done the last thing He told you to do, don't get ready to hear another word until you finish what He told you before. God gives us a direction to do something. He's told us to do something, and if we're not going to do it, then don't go back and look for another direction because we didn't like what he told us the first time until we fulfill that place and we do what he said. I, I remember, uh, and, and I, learned, I learned this the first time from Glenn Smith. Um, and I can talk about Glenn because he's already dancing around the throne, you know, and, and uh, he doesn't care anymore about this. But one time he gave me some uh, advice. And I did the other thing. <laughs> well, you know, from time to time, Glenn had given me advice. Man, he'd been in a ministry about 20 years longer than I had. And uh, so it was, uh, and, and, and some of the things that I was doing, I'd never done before, but he'd already been there 20 years before. And so I, I, uh, I'd call him and I'd ask him, well, he gave me advice about a certain guy. And uh, actually what he told me was watch out. I didn't watch out. Man, it was a wreck. Bad wreck. I called Glenn and, and, and I told him this. I said, uh, Glenn, I repent for not doing what you told me to do. And man, it was a bad wreck. He says, well, I knew it was going to be. He said, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you to watch out. And uh, he said, since you repented, I wasn't ever going to give you advice again. <laughs> but since you repented... I'll go ahead and give you advice whenever you, you ask for it. And, uh, you know, sometimes we hear something from God and we go, man, I'm not going to back off and I'm not going to do that. You know, I mean, that, that'll cost me this much time and I'll have to give up this and I'll have to give up. And when we don't, then what happens is God's not going to give us another something to do until we do what he, what he already did, what he already told us to do. And when we finish that, or when we begin to go that way, he might only give you a little bit of, of direction to go a certain way. And then we're looking for what the finish is going to be, and we're not going to get the finish until... I'm going to tell you, there's some things the Lord has, has told me little bits at a time that if he'd have told me the whole thing when we started, it has scared me so bad I might not have done it. God wants to have you go a direction so that you'll be able to get more direction so that you can get in that place that you'll have an expected finish like his word says so that I'll know exactly what I'm doing is what, what he wanted me to do because I see what the fruit of it is. Stand and let's say this together. Say, I hear the Lord. I listen to him. 
I do what he says. I hear the inward witness. And I follow it. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you how your word lives in us how your spirit leads us and guides us. I pray over all those that are here and those that are watching by internet that, Father, that you'll lead them by your spirit and you'll cause them to rise to a new level in their life. Father, as you begin to reveal yourself in greater ways, that they'll be better listeners in all places. No matter how good they listen now, Father, that we'll listen even better in each place. Father, I give you glory and honor and power in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood. Amen. Amen. Jesus loves you and so do we. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10, 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with the heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make him the Lord of your life. And as you make him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know that God loves you, he'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus loves you and so do we.